Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Catholic Truth Podcast, where we teach and preach the Catholic faith, which has come down to us from 2,000 years from Jesus Christ and the apostles. We want to help you to know your faith, love your faith, live your faith, and defend it. And we want you to be transformed by Jesus Christ. We love all of you who tune in uh, to our videos. And as you know, we sometimes have guests who are experts in their field or who have stories to share. And today we have a wonderful guest named Jeremiah Bannister. And he was actually a pastor, a Protestant pastor who became Catholic, but then he became city of a contest. He journeyed to atheism and then back to the Catholic church where he now resides. He is a Catholic journalist, a Catholic speaker, and a Catholic YouTuber. He is a contributor to the meaning of Catholic, which is meaning of Catholic.com. And you can find his articles there. And he is the editor in chief of Paleocrat Diaries, which has a ton of information, uh, videos, uh, articles, and pretty much anything you want to know about city of Contism, uh, extreme Catholicism, and many, many other topics as well. So I would recommend that, and we will link that down below in our show notes if you want to check it out and follow Jeremiah. And uh, we want to welcome you to the show, Jeremiah. Thanks for joining us today. Well, thank you. It, it was It's an honor. I'm glad to be here. I was shocked, in fact, when you when I read the message uh, from you. I'm like, are you serious? <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> like, I will definitely be on the show. <laughs> I would love to, in fact. So this is a real honor. I appreciate it. Yeah, our pleasure too. And uh, you're extremely well studied and I appreciate a lot of your uh, views and your talks. And um, one thing, you know, is maybe you could start off by giving us a very nut short nutshell version. I know we could do a whole show on it, but a very nutshell version of how you went from Protestant to Catholic and then ended up at Sede Vacantis. I mean, why did yeah, you become yeah. a Sede Vacantis in the first place? Well, when, when I, growing up, we were anti-Catholic. My mom was raised Catholic, one of 11. Uh, went through the Jesus movement, right? Charismatic, uh, the uh, Christian Businessmen Association stuff. And the, the father, the patriarch of the family, ended up walking away uh, and became Protestant. So my whole life was within that framework, right? And growing up, you know, I got into apologetics. I went to Bible college at Christ for the Nations, an institute in Dallas, and started studying theology, apologetics as a Calvinist. And so I, when the blogosphere came around, I started making blogs and started debating, uh, writing articles against Catholicism and how they worship Mary and <laughs> how they believe the Pope is perfect and all these things that were grotesque misunderstandings. Um, and I learned very quickly um, how misinformed I was about Catholicism because people were commenting back. And I had a lot of individuals at that time on Zanga because uh, we'd get about 125 comments under different posts and stuff from different people. And it, they were either... FSSP, uh, SSPX, Eastern Orthodox, or Eastern Catholic. There weren't many people, there weren't many diocesan Catholics in my, in my chat, in my comments and stuff. And so they encouraged me, they said, where are you getting these ideas about Catholicism? And I, I brought up the book, Roman Catholicism by, by Bettner. And I, oh, I said, well, I know. And they were like, they're like, have you ever read the bibliography? And I'm like, no. So I go and I'm looking at it and it was, it was embarrassing. I'm like, there's hardly any direct references to Catholic, anything historical. Like, I mean, and I said, so I need to go and, and read something from Catholics about Catholicism. So I went to my first time to a Catholic bookstore, which was very strange. I'd never seen like rosaries. I'd seen them on in cars and stuff, but never in person. Uh, miraculous medals everywhere, <laughs> you know, holy cards. I didn't even know those were a thing. And all these books had people wearing habits, investments and stuff. And it was just very strange. And I didn't know what to buy. I didn't know who I was looking for. And I found a book, and in fact, it's funny, I was talking about it with somebody this morning, right here, The Catholic Controversy. Oh, yes. And so this plays heavily into my method of- Fantastic of, book. Yes, oh, totally. And it's one of those things, because it was, I, I'm reading the back, so this looks kind of fascinating, you know, a defense of the faith. So I look at the back, and I find out, oh, wow, it's written to people in Geneva that were Calvinists and stuff. And wow, exactly. 72,000 people returned? I'm like, yeah. okay, well, maybe this is something I should read. So I read it. And you got to remember, I, I'm a pastor reading this. And the, he begins with authority. He starts almost the, almost a third, the first third of the book is purely an apologetic from authority and saying, look, where, where do you get your authority for your orders, your extraordinary calling, your mission, uh, the ability to, to interpret text and stuff. And I, even for the canon itself, and I'm sitting there thinking, I don't have holy orders. 
Like I, I, I don't, I don't have this, and I began to understand it, and it, and it really, caught, I had despair, depression to the extreme, uh, because I didn't know, you know, was everything I've ever done kind of for a loss. I felt ashamed, and so I, it was about another year, about well, six months after reading this, and I went in and talked to my wife and said uh, she was sleeping, and I get, went by the bed and I said I'm going to mass today. And she said, I kind of wondered when this would happen. I said, you can go to church. I, you can use the car with the kids. It's okay. And she goes, I go where you go. She said, you've been doing this for, you know, almost a year and a half. And you're the kind of guy, she said, you've, you're valiant. You will fight. You're a fighter. And you lost. But I think you kind of won. Because I think you're right with this. And we trust you as a family. We'll follow where you go with this. So... I went to church that day. It happened to be the feast day of St. Francis de Sales. I had no clue. And then about wow. two weeks, I know. And two weeks later, I write about it online and stuff. I tell people what I, my decision, uh, James White talked about it on his pod, podcast, I guess, or something somehow came up. And that got the attention of Scott Hahn, who called me on the phone while I was at school, journalism wow. school. And he calls me on the phone because he heard the story, the background. And he talks and he goes, well, he said, you're, you're a journalist, right? I said, well, I'm in school for that. And he goes, yeah, St. Saint, Saint Francis de Sales is your patron. I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> like, I'm like, I have a feeling that this saint has been hunting me down. Like it's not, <laughs> I didn't find him, he found me. That was something somebody said in a chat recently. And I said, I resonate with that. So, but I, I came in, but I, I had come in and immediately, I kind of did the Audrey Assad thing where you're, you're already doing something uh, in an industry. You come over and you continue doing it. You don't take the time to step away, take a breath, get down to the basics because you're a baby in this you don't know what you're doing and i immediately began doing catholic apologetics um i put myself out there a lot and i was young and a lot of a lot of pride in fact <laughs> there was a lot going on with that and it's just true and it's scrupulous and in fact sinful in many ways things that i struggled with when i was younger and i was getting very frustrated with the condition of the modern church and over things that are, in fact, I think, issues that I can understand why they'd be frustrating for people, right? Even to this day that I say, I, I understand where you're coming from. I think your response is wrong, but I at least understand where you're coming from. But I, I, I didn't know how to deal with it. And I became very critical of, of the church. I, I refused to any longer go to the ordinary form of the mass. And so I was still diocesan. Because of a um, lot of the abuses that were happening and such, and a lot of the things that you saw that you didn't like. Well, even, yeah, and, and not even abuses, because in fairness, I had never really seen, I'd never seen a clown mass. Like somebody last night in the chat. <laughs> yeah, I'd never seen it, you know, like I, there's somebody in the chat last night over on Telegram, where we have our, our Wolfpack chat, they we're talking about how they went to a, a mass recently where the priest came down in the procession on roller skates. I mean, you know, and I, I, I can beat that. I had a priest where he came down on a mechanical lion walking down the aisle. Yeah. I, I didn't, I, to be fair, I wasn't there. My best friend was there. If I was there, I may have kicked over the mechanical lion. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what, what do you do? But I've never, I've never been to that. I've never seen that, but it was little things like, um, you know, it, it was it was the fact that the priest um, not only, you know, do they have uh, their hands set apart for the touching of the, the Eucharist, but the ones who are stricter, if people are paying attention once they've consecrated it, they keep their fingers together. They latch on to the chalice with the re remaining fingers. They wait till water's poured over. And I said, young people see that in the same way that they do looking up and seeing stained glass windows and learning you know, even if they don't know how to read, they can see what people are doing and behaviors. But then they see the priest doing that and they see, you know, the patent out and everybody's really strict about everything. But then they see, you know, Susan from Parish Council come up and she's man, you know, woman handling the Eucharist, body of Christ, body of Christ and putting it in people's hands. There's no patent from there to there. And I said there to me, there was a disconnect. And I said, how can can you say that that's important what the priest is doing? When it's when somebody can put it in their hand, and no patent in between, put it in their mouth, no patent in between, rub their hands like this, stuck their hand in their pocket. I said, and then and then the priest goes back, still fingers like this until water goes over it. Then he releases. I said to me there was a disconnect, and I I so it wasn't just cr abuses that people would normally think that made me frustrated. Um, but I I skipped right over the SSPX. <laughs> I said I'm not, I'm not I, and my priest. I, I need to say this quickly. My priest um was concerned for me and he came up to me and he handed me this book 
this right here. This right here, we call it yellow pilled. Mm -hmm. Okay. This right here, I have a 20 part series at Meaning of Catholic under the Jeremiah Bannister playlist. 20 part series on this book. We went through, uh, this is Ronald Knox. It's his magnum opus. Um, and he, my priest handed this to me. And he said, this is a really crazy book. There's wild stories in it. Some of them are really obscure, schismatic groups that people don't even know of. Um, he said, but I think you need to read this. And I didn't. And I, it just sat on my, my bookshelf and I ended up finding my way to set of a contism. And so I was a set of a contest all together for about a year, but I, I was only involved with um, it, it institutionally where you're going to a chapel, right? I only did that for about seven months, I think, um, eight months. And that was with a CMRI. And so I was involved there. I taught catechism to kids for first communion. Um, very involved with that. I made YouTube videos. And there was a time on YouTube where my my videos were the second most watched set of Acontis videos only behind um, the Diamond Brothers. So you had the Diamond Brothers and you had Jeremiah Bannister. And then you had people like One True Church and others that were also there. But at the time, my videos would have been the second most watched of set of Acontis on the entire YouTube, right? Yeah, so, and I would love <clears throat> to debunk the Diamond Brothers of Vatican Catholic. They need to be seriously debunked in the future because <laughs> they're yeah, extremely yeah. problematic as well and deceive many. Yeah, I have a couple of videos um, against them okay. and they have a couple of videos against me. I'm sure they do. Yeah, they do. I used to be on their, their um, you know, Captain Crunch index of forbidden trads, you know, like so they they stuff they pull out of you know uh cereal box kind of thing you know <laughs> they put a quarter in and it's like it's it's all larping i mean that's it, just their opinion and they kind of shroud it and swaddle it with a fake sense of authority and so they, they but they put together a list of trads that you aren't allowed to really listen to which typically ends up being any trad that would be that disagrees like with competition that. yeah any yeah. <laughs> any competition they're like no <laughs> these people aren't just bad they're they're raging heretics which Really, I mean, you can, at that point, you can almost say, well, if you just have a list of the people who are devoutly connected with uh, Vatican Catholic, if, if you have a list of those people, that's pretty much the Book of Life. I, I don't think St. Peter needs anything beyond that. Like, it's just, <laughs> you just go, yeah, so that's the Book of Life right there. And you're like, yeah, it's the role for the for Vatican Catholic. Um, so, but yeah, that's, so I was in there and. So you were yeah. a CDVA contest. You were a CDVA contest for about a year, taught catechism, helped out in the church for about seven months. And. <clears throat> what made you start to doubt it? What made you start to, where, where, what were the inconsistencies that you began to see that made you maybe start to rethink it? Well, the, the inconsistencies, it all came back and this has haunted me forever. He's never let me go. Right. It all comes back to this. Such it all comes point. back to the arguments from uh, presupposition of authority to say, by what standard, by what authority, you know, because they all have different opinions. There's multiple different opinions within set of a contest. It's not one thing. That's like an umbrella term. You know, there's even competing factions. There's independent bishops having mass at the Motel 6 and stuff. So, I mean, you got, it's a, a weird, a weird, crazy thing. Um, but they don't have any means by which to settle any disputes at all. And so... Like Protestants. Yes. Well, and, and ultimately, because their most ruling assumption, I say I say they have verms on the brain and enthusiasm in their veins because <laughs> they yeah, because the reason why I say they have verms on the brain and people it is, I think, an oversimplistic statement to say that they are Protestant. If, that, if that's all you say and you just say, well, they're just Protestants. I think you're it's more complex than that. However, agreed. I think there are many similarities, though. Oh, totally. And it, the most important being their most ruling assumptions. And that being that they're standing at Worms and saying the popes have contradicted each other, the councils have contradicted each other. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm standing here unless reason and scripture compel me. And I would say they've just added to scripture in their canon of what they are analyzing, putting the monocle on and God in the dock to analyze to see if it, it meets their criterion as the ultimate authority that they just add encyclicals and bulls and councils. But they are they themselves at the end they are the ones who are the authority on the interpretation of those things. And so I said, that's the same as, as Verms. That's what that is. I said, he's saying, look, I, unless it matches up here, I'm going to look and analyze this. The church isn't the one as the ground of authority. It's me and my reason and everything else. Um, and that's what they do, which, which ends up resulting in enormous amounts of pride, 
enormous amounts, strangely, of despair, scruples, uh, schism, right? Schism, uh, breeding schism, breeding schism, and never, never having a mechanism by which to ever resolve anything, and including the mere existence of set of accountism, which I believe is what will be with us forever. Because even if even if we had a future pope that said Vatican II is bad, Novus Ordo is bad, it's out. There were so many other things over the last, you know, since Vatican II that have happened and that have been integrated into all of the stuff that we believe that there will be people who say, yeah, they did this, but that's not enough because it only takes one drop of, of heresy and the whole the whole thing is spoiled. So I, I'm not going to accept this. You know, and so you're, we will, a set of a contism shall always be with us, in my opinion. Yeah. 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 Um, <clears throat> so one of the big things you say are saying is that you started to see the competing sex within uh, set of a contism, the competing groups. Um, could you talk a little bit more about those groups? You know, the, you know, maybe the hierarchical groups from the, you know, sit on your couch at home groups and like, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's very interesting that when Protestants broke away, it was so quick before they broke into different splinter groups. And I saw the same thing with Sadie David contests too, you know, it was so quick before they, oh, well, this one's not, you know, strict enough, or this one's heretical. And they started condemning each other in the same way that Protestants did. And, um, you know, that, I mean, from the outside looking in, that's a concern for me, but, you know, you lived it. So, you know, maybe you could talk really briefly, like a nutshell version of those yeah. different sects and uh, your problem that you faced. Yeah. If, if I can, can I say one more thing? You yeah. asked me why I left. Also, I wanted to say one more thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, free. They there, there was a hyper laicization in this. And this is stuff that this is why enthusiasm is such an important book, because Anyone who reads that book is going to very quickly recognize that set of a contism is in fact an enthusiasm, and they would say, you know, it follows the same the same structure, um, which I lay out in a book in a in a, a article that I wrote um, entitled "I Was a Set of a Contest and Enthusiast." It's over at one Peter five, but it it breaks down like this: otherwise decent people taking otherwise good things too far. Point number one. So charity in the beginning. More and more, they're drawn apart from co-religionists provocations begin to happen on both sides okay so uh, the the institution of the church it, it was saying look at these rigorous people making fun of the the holiness the idea that they're trying to be super holy holier than now and on the other side going at them saying that they're loosey-goosey loosening the belt accepting and being gracious to people who are going to hell and stuff uh, a condemnation or secession and schism takes place for the sect the church uh has unchurched itself so this the person who's leaving um the enthusiast would say that the church has not just made a mistake but in fact unchurched itself um this leads to end time speculation and that they're the remnant that's remaining leaders arise but then divisions begin resulting in of course not only the the creation of institutions which we'll talk about in a second but also uh divisions from those institutions because why submit to them uh intersectarian efforts to unite so you'll start to see that happen in the, that timeline where they say we gotta we gotta come together, you know, like we're we're all divided, but we all agree on some core principles. So you'll have that kind of ecumenical dynamic within the groups. Uh, they'll inevitably fail uh, because they're paralyzed by their presupposition. They're paralyzed by verms in the brain because they're all their own little authority. They're all their own popes and rabbis and and pastors and everything. So the ultimate authority is with them, and so it's kind of like herding cats. The sect continues unabated because failure becomes them, right? They're beautiful losers in that sense. They're, that, they're the remnant, they're proud of it, in fact. Uh, and then lay people leave. And they're either cynical, they're crushed by the Herculean demands of the system, um, especially if you're like a, a home alone or where there's no sacraments at all. And so it follows that, that timeline. And, and so institutions in the book, that's the, the, not the timeline, the structure of how enthusiasm is born and how it develops and the interplay between the enthusiasm and the group they're leaving. And so that's all in this book. And you can see that play out with Set of a Contest. And you see it, for example, the groups that we're talking about, um, SSPV, okay, uh, Society of uh, uh, Pope St. Pius V, that's a group uh, departed from the SSPX, okay? So it, it, a lot of this honestly goes back to the SSPX uh, and Lefebvre. And there, in fact, there's a, there's a great video by a set of a contest a, a, a priest an otherwise decent guy i mean he was a, he was one of those guys that you could listen to and you'd probably end up liking him and you'd feel badly that you disagreed with him 
but he was wrong, right? His name was Father Jakarta. He passed away, um, and and it's a tragic thing, in fact. But he um, he has a, a video. I think it's called SSPX and Sour Grapes or something like that. And he talks about the history of set of acontism, even within Lefebvre, and how he'd be tolerant of it and saying maybe the church is unchurch itself kind of thing, and it's a robber council, a counterfeit council. Maybe the throne is vacant, but then he'd be in talks with the Pope, and all of a sudden now he's cracking down on people who believe that sort of thing. It was it was back and forth and back and forth, and it was difficult, and eventually people ended up leaving, right? And so you had you had um, people leave and eventually start different groups. Um, but the thing is, is once they do that, whether it's over the liturgy, for example, like the SSPV, uh, they, they go back to a missile even predating uh, the changes. Um, they, they, don't, they wouldn't accept the 1962, for example, which is what the SSPX uh, submits to, and that's what most traditional Latin masses, that's what they use. Um, so they go back even before that. Some of them go back even before that and say, well, the changes in Holy Week by Pius XII, those were wrong. So they use an even older missile. Um, and then you have the CMRI, which is connected with um, uh, Took, right? What they call the Took line. And that's kind of a wild ride because the individual who was um, uh, consecrating bishops and stuff like that, right? The elevating bishops, he was doing it sometimes in garages. There was a question as to whether or not he was even mentally sane. Uh, when it was going on and so there's there's debates between the cmri and the sspv people can watch that online between set of accountants who question the legitimacy of the orders of you know are your priests even valid priests over at the cmri are you even a valid bishop over at the cmri and so um you know it's it's you have that group uh you have independent ones right so you may you may have a priest with a chapel he's just kind of a roving priest you may have a bishop who's a roving bishop, one guy, one bishop called me on the phone and wanted me to stop going to the CMRI. He wanted me to go to uh, the mot it was a motel, right? That he came once a month, uh, him and a nun driving alone, the two of them in a car. And I'm like, holy cow, that's <laughs> a little scandalous maybe, <laughs> you know, traveling the, traveling the country with you and a nun in the car, um, you know, and staying together and stuff. I said, you didn't learn the lesson from like, you know, Madame Guyana and stuff. But the, um, the thing is, is he said, you know, you should stop going there. He said, you should go to my mass at this motel. Uh, he said, I have, I have mass in my trunk, is what he said. So you'll have those people. And then you'll have people who, um, you know, that they uh, don't, even go to, don't even go to mass at all. They're home aloners. And so those individuals believe that there are no priests, there are no sacraments, in fact, other than baptism, right? So baptism, um, they may make a marriage, for example. You can still be, get married kind of thing, um, but every other sacrament, so there's no confession. So they, they have to make perfect act of contritions. You know, I mean, and that's Herculean. That's why I said that lay, people will leave because they're cynical and they're crushed by a Herculean system because in a, a perfect act of contrition is hypothetically possible, right? But I mean, like, if that's all you've got, that's it. There's no Eucharist, there's no nothing. And so you're just left at, at you know, um, to your own powers in many ways, praying mass at home with your family and all that. So there's there's a wide variety. And within each of those, there's differences. You know, some of them are hard ad, hardline advocates of Father Feeney's idea that without water baptism, uh, you're definitely going to hell. You have others who say, well, there's baptism of desire, baptism of blood and invincible ignorance. And that's a huge division over there. And so, but no matter what the divisions are, there's no way to, to resolve it. They're, they're left in the same boat as denominationalism because, in fact, that's what it is. And so you have, it's denominationalism, uh, and now it's just reached the place where they say the denominations are toast, and so we are home churches. That's all it is. Um, it follows Lowest the same. Lowest common denominator. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, now, did you say that there are no sacraments besides baptism in sede vacantism? Uh, in home aloners. Okay. And because they don't the believe there's sex? any priests. Oh yeah. They, for them, they just go on like normal. So they, they would thought, go. You know. My friend around our area here in New England, there's only two churches, the hardcore St. David contests are allowed to go to. And one of them's in Boston. Uh, so you have to travel hours every week just to get to this church, which is supposedly the only real church and all other Latin masses are false. Um, and he says that they don't have all valid sacraments 
Um, like he can't go to confession. Like when he wants to go to confession, he has to go to an SSPX church. He says, um, does that sound familiar to you? Like, why would that be? No, I, I, I've never experienced that. Okay. Uh, and so I, I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure what that's all about. Um, you know, but like, uh, the CMRI, they would have, they would have confessions there. They would have baptisms. They'd have marriages. They'd have the whole nine yards. If you're dying, you get extreme unction. So like, you know, all of those would be there. And the bishop over there, Pivarunas, you know, you can make, you can make bishops, you can make priests. It's no thing. You can do okay. that. So he's kind of, it's like an autocephalous church, right? So they're, they're just kind of in their own world. He's the ruler of this church and that they, they kind of decide where they want to go for whatever reasons they want to go. They don't have to collaborate with anybody or subject themselves to anybody. They're just kind of under, you know, under him and that's it. Themselves, um, yeah. Yeah, under him, yeah, themselves. It, it and, doesn't make sense to me though, how somebody, the, the home owners, and there's a, a good number of them, um, but it doesn't make sense to me how someone could in good conscience say, oh, well, there's no sacraments left in the church. You know, there's just no church. There's no priest. There's no sacraments. Like, how does that, in a Catholic milieu, how does that, how could you justify that? It doesn't make sense. Yeah. It seems like the gates of hell would have prevailed, huh? Oh, totally. 100%. <laughs> like, if you have, if you have, uh, you have no sacraments, you have, there's no doubt. I mean, you're, you're just toast. And, you know, there's like a gaggle of you left. There's like, you know, you know, 20 or 30, there's dozens. <laughs> there's dozens of you left on the planet. It's gotten that bad. Um, and so, but they, they wear that as a badge of honor. They, they, in fact, you got, and you got to think there's a sense of pride that comes with that. If you're one of, one of dozens of people or in, and I'm being a little bit tongue in cheek with that, let's say, let's say hundreds. <laughs> so there's hundreds of home owners, right? Hundreds of home owners who are strict about home alone set of a contism. And those individuals would believe that it's possible that maybe you could, you could still be a Catholic and still go to heaven if you're outside of that. But it's kind of more assured that you're really you're you're in the in crowd, right? You're inside the inner circle, and so it's kind of it's not just that you you're fortunately part of this this truth, but more than that, that you are part of that in the end times. You're part of that in the very end of all time, and that eternity will recognize you as the saints that were faithful when the church had lost everything, no pope, no sacraments. So there's a sense of pride, in fact, that comes with that. Pride. I see so yeah, much yeah. pride in the city of Contism system. Even from the people I talk to, it's like, they're right. Everyone else in the world is wrong. They're alone and not just other city of contest, only their sect of city of Contism is right. And only they're saved and everyone else is literally going to hell. Like, like how do you even combat that? How do you even talk to people like that? I mean, it's, it seems very prideful and it seems very emotional to me. I guess, you know, it fits your book that you mentioned, but I've always found say to contest arguments to be emotional primarily. Yes. They will quote sources, you know, ad nauseum and yes, they will refer to our fathers, but I found that the base of a lot of them, and this is my understanding, it seems emotional to me. Well, look at what happened after Vatican II. Look at the church and how it's collapsed. Clearly, it's because of Vatican II. Or look at what these priests are doing in the Novus Ordo sect. You know, clearly, yeah. you know, compared to the Latin mass that we go to, clearly we're right. Like my Sede Vecantis friend said, you know what? I didn't feel Jesus in the Novus Ordo mass. I feel him much more in the Sede Vecantis church. And uh, even though it's not a church. And uh I, I said, you know what? Mormons say the same thing. They have a burning right. in their bosom and Protestants say the same thing. When they leave the Catholic church, they're like, I finally feel fed. You know, I finally right. feel like I found Jesus. I was like, these are all to me, subjective, emotional arguments. And, um, and it misses the whole point of that. The, the bigger underlining issues of the state of a system, like not being able to choose a Pope or, um, you know, no way to have, they have no way to choose a Pope. Like, was that a concern for you as a St. David Contest? Like, did that bother you at all? Yeah. I, I bring this up in, in my, I have videos in the enthusiasm series. There's four, there's kind of the core of the whole thing at the center of the, the 20 uh, is, a, is Jansenism because Ronald Knox dedicates multiple chapters to Jansenism. Um, I think he had the finger on the pulse of where the church was going to be dealing with things. And I'm glad he emphasized that. Um, but the, in that in that series, I, I talk uh, not only about Jansenism, but set of Vacantism, the idea of worms in the brain, enthusiasm in the veins, sort of thing, with how that uh, operates. And um, one of the things that I brought up was that there's no way 
for them to actually resolve the 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 pulp problem right that they they kind of fall into different camps one of those being well it's the end times and we're not going to have a pope we're we're waiting on the end and that's you know could happen any moment right kind of has rapture fever a, a hint of rapture fever to it then you have some who believe that you know saints peter and paul uh they're going to cut through the clouds there's going to be this miraculous thing that happens in rome uh because it would have to happen in rome they talk about that the sea itself over there there's something important that would it would require them you couldn't just have a pope like pope michael for example in kansas we i've interviewed him by the way um and so like um you can't just for have our that audience just for our audience who's pope michael just because a pope, lot of people yeah. might not know pope, pope michael i encourage you if you want to know about pope michael you've got to go there's a video it's it has the charm of napoleon dynamite but it's real <laughs> Um, and so it's true, even the music with it and stuff, but he's, he's a guy from Kansas, a thick draw, you know, in his voice and stuff. And, uh, basically was voted by his mom and dad and a couple other people voted as the Pope. Cause he, he was a set of a contest who recognized, uh, he's a, called a conclavist. Okay. And so the idea of a conclavist is we can't, we can't be in this predicament, right? This, the, the Pope is essential. We wouldn't be able to, to deal with things. In fact, that's where orders would be your, as St. Francis de Sales talks about extraordinary callings, anytime a Protestant or a set of a contest or SSPX, anybody talks about an extraordinary mission, you can only really do that through the ordinary, through the vicar. That's because Christ is the one that dispenses this and it goes through the vicar. If you don't have the vicar, then anybody could claim that. Anybody, and, and he says that's what the Protestants do, which is ecclesiastical anarchy, right? So you end up having all these churches and everything explode. So, but the thing is with these guys, so uh, Pope Michael is claims that he's the Pope and you need to subject yourself to him. And he lives in with his parents. He lives, I think he does mass in the attic of his house. Um, he, I don't even think he was, I don't even think he was a priest when he was uh, <laughs> made um, Pope <laughs> by his mom and dad, you know? And so like, but there, there's a documentary you can watch and there's a couple guys that went out there. Uh, they're going around doing speeches and stuff. And he, he writes the equivalent of like encyclicals on Facebook and stuff. So he's kind of a fascinating guy and he's actually, he's actually very intelligent. Like if you talk to him, he's one of those, he knows his brief, right? He's got it. He's got his quotes, boom, 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 boom. And he, he'll, that's, he's on the spectrum. Okay. He's one of those spectrum guys and he's on the spectrum. So you, you, and when you, if you're going to talk to him, you at least need to be familiar with arguments he's going to present and stuff like that. Um, but anyway, so like, you know, you have the conclavists, you have the home aloners, but the, the idea of a Pope and how, do you, how would you get it? Let's say that the SSPV and the CMRI came together, right? And they said, we're going to, we're going to come together and we're going to get St. Gertrude the Great. We're going to get that, that group over here. We're going to get some others and we're going to come together. We're the only bishops remaining on the planet. We're going to come together and we are going to, to vote for a Pope. And let's, let's say they popularize it. They put it on, on they do press releases and everything. They get a beautiful place to do it in. And um, nobody cares. <laughs> Instead of a condes don't care either because they're, they're not beholden to that. There's no, that's not magisterial authority. So they, they would say, look, why, why do I need to submit to you guys saying that? And I, because at the end of the day, it's, they're kind of in the same predicament with church authority and making decisions that the Orthodox would be in. That you can have, you can have a patriarch over in one place and a patriarch in another, and they disagree with each other, and you're like, well, I guess we'll have to wait and see if they ever agree. Like that's the end of it. There is no, there's nothing above them to come down and say, this is the end, guys. Submit or you're out. Like there's none because they don't have pope. So and it's the same if thing. They did with, choose a pope, it wouldn't be the pope anyways because it wouldn't be a valid pope, would it? And, no, uh, yeah, no, yeah, of course not. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's no college of cardinals as far as I know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, but there, yeah, they would just be. You know, essentially, this is a big, a big LARP. And that's, that's the sad thing is it's it, a big live action role play that's happening here. <laughs> and, and they take it super serious. And you're like, dude, the Renaissance Fair is one thing, right? But you guys are taking this nostalgia. And I, and I, I again, a little tongue in cheek, but there's something there too to say, there are people go and they, they connect it in different ways. I got, I'm not just ragging on people from Ren fairs. This is medieval festival shield behind me, Blackrock. So my daughter's a princess for indefinitely for all time at one. So I, I'm not going to judge. Right. But at the same time, I don't make that my religion, but I know people who there's something they, they don't like the world, right? They don't like the way they're treated. They don't like the way things are working out. Maybe they were bullied. Maybe they, they're not, they don't get along with a lot of people. They're introverted and they're shy, but they can go there and they put this stuff on. And all of a sudden they're, they have, they're the princess for the day. They feel 
there's an identity with that. And it's personal, deeply personal for some of them. I think that those are similar mechanisms at play where people say, I don't like the feeling of the church right now. And they go to this and they say, I feel this way while I'm here. Exactly. And, and they, because they want that, they don't like how they feel out there. They feel that identity in here and they don't realize that underneath it. And I mentioned that in my article that, um, th this idea that the, the movie, um, I'm trying to think which, which movie it's a, it's a David Lynch film and it's, um, uh, Blue Velvet. I do not encourage people to go watch the movie, <laughs> but I said it's, it's, it's scandalous. But it, the beginning of the film is this beautiful scene with white picket fence and there's roses and everything. And it, it's got this music, this kind of class, uh, uh, oldies music and stuff. And the dad's out there with a hose and all this, and he's watering this plush green grass. And then he has a heart attack, boom. And he's on the ground. And in, in uh, David Lynch fashion, he drops this the camera down and it goes below the surface of the, the earth that he's dying on and underneath is garbage and within the soil there's insects and just grossness worms and they're just all over each other and i said that is the underbelly the underworld of what people see and feel when they go in and they're experiencing this static thing that says it feels like 1950s it th this is what the, the saints must have experienced and you go, no, it's not what they experienced, right? They experienced in, in the in the most in in a way that's kind of like, yeah, people going and jousting. That must be what the knights experienced. And you're like, are you are you texting your buddy that right now on a phone? Like that the knight didn't do that, right? Their social imaginary wasn't even the same. Their their reality wasn't the same. You're not. You can't go back into that world like that and think that that's sufficient to make you the same. And they don't understand the underbelly, the sickness that's at play whether a sin or schism or or even even you know uh you know mental and psychological issues there's a lot I, of that i think yeah. that's a huge point that you just said yeah it might feel better but there are a lot of mental and psychological issues that we need to deal with first of all and the bigger problem is is it true you might right. feel better in a particular church but that's a subjective feeling is it true is it the true church that's been around for 2000 years they'll say yes we're the remnant but mormons claim to be the remnant and so do jehovah's yeah. witnesses and seventh day adventists and the church of christ and countless other remnant restorationist groups and they're just one of countless schismatic groups down through the ages that all claim to be the true church all claim that rome is wrong all claim that the catholic church has dropped the ball and it's just one thing after another after another and to me I mean, I talked to the state of a contest and they're like, yeah, we don't have a way to choose a Pope, but you know what? God will take care of that. To me, I'm like, no, you're not, that should be a huge issue for you, but you are, you're, you're falling back on conspiracy theories. Like the blessed Virgin Mary, we think will come down and, you know, shine her light on the man. And then when she shines her light on the man, they'll know, or the Holy spirit will come down and we'll see light from heaven. And when it, you know, comes on his head and it, you know, enlightens, you know, then we'll know that that's the Pope. I'm like, and I always stop them at yeah. this point. I'm like, are you listening to yourself? Right. You've literally right. gone you know, so far that you have to indulge in conspiracy theories that won't happen, not even may or may not happen, won't happen, right. Right. but you're taking them out almost as fact rather than the underlining principle of fact that you have no way to an elect a pope. And therefore, if you don't, can it even be the true church? Well, they just, they'll just say, well, the interregnum could go on a very long time. And I say, because for you guys, it, it literally will. There will always be, even if you are satisfied with it, your fellow set of a contest may not be. And you're going to be in the exact same position that I am dealing with you because you're going to recognize now that, well, but they change this and change that. And the person's going to say, but not this and that. And now you're going to be back to by what authority is uh, do set of a contest make their decisions at all. And they don't have any, that's the whole, that's the whole point. So the same, the same underlying problem with why they can't elect a Pope is the same one, why it's the same reason why they're not in a place to make any of these decisions to make any of these statements regarding well like i'm putting my stamp of disapproval on you and you're on the index this is totally fake this this is a list of things i don't like that's all that is things that, but they, but they again I, I said earlier they swaddle that with this this nonsensical idea of authority and they always go back they beg the question because they say well but the church has said and you say but that's what's under dispute and I said, what, what does Jesus give us for disputes? You got a problem? Bring it to your brother. Okay, that's what we've done. Bring two or three witnesses. Okay, we've done that. Bring it to the church. 
and they would go, okay. And you go, and then if they don't listen to the church, and I say, can you guys do that part? <laughs> if, if you can't, you do not bear the marks of the church. You are no different than the people across the street at the, at the Baptist church or the people over the Pentecostal church or the Episcopalian church, because they could make a ruling, but you are not obliged as a Protestant to subject yourself. You get kicked out of the church of God for playing cards or dancing at a, at a, at a, a marriage ceremony or drinking alcohol. Just go across the street to the Presbyterian church. They're not going to kick you out. And the pastor would say, yeah, there's Phyllis. We, we have theological disagreements maybe even over things as, as, as essential as baptism. But you know what? They're not going to say that that person is going to hell unless they're like, you know, way out there on maybe LGBT issues or something like that. Like, but differences, because you have p people all the time that disagree over baptism or communion, especially over playing cards or dancing. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. I said, you're in the same boat. <clears throat> they could tell you you're not allowed to do this. We'll go to the SSPV. They say you can't become a home alone. It doesn't matter. Because at the end of the day, they're the one wearing the monocle, looking at everything and putting God in the dock. They got it completely backward. It all really comes down to their own personal opinions, doesn't it? I mean, you, yeah. I, I listen to Protestants all day long attack the Catholic Church and they'll say Rome is wrong about the Bible. You know, it clearly says this in the Bible. It clearly yeah. says this in the Bible. But not only does the Catholic Church disagree with your interpretation of the Bible, not only do Protestants disagree with your interpretation of the Bible, not only does the early Christians disagree with your so it all comes down to this is what i think the bible is saying and i feel like you know sadie vicantis is the same thing the church says this but it really is my own opinion of the church because the church already says what it says the church has authoritatively taught what it says and nobody can out church the church on canon law because they have no authority right. yeah, or yeah. on anything else yeah there's a um I, I wish i had it in front of me yeah so uh Pope Leo the Thirteenth, right, an encyclical on Christian citizenship, uh, paragraph thirty-seven. Okay, and there's actually two paragraphs that are that are especially good. Um, he's talking about in uh, thirty-five, thirty-seven, and I believe forty, which begins. Uh, uh, no, 39, the church, it is certain at no time and in no particular is deserted by God. <laughs> so r right away, right? Uh, hence, there's no reason why we should be alarmed at the <laughs> wickedness of men, right? And so, I mean, you, you, you right, right out of the gate. But, um, you know, in 37, he's talking, they're talking about uh, what do you do when, when you have somebody who does something that's bad, right? You see... Uh, you see a, a priest or you see someone in the hierarchy that does something that's wrong. How ought you to behave? And he says there's different takes on that. Uh, one of those is like a false sense of prudence and another one is a false zeal. The false prudence is the one that goes, well, I'm not, who am I to judge anything kind of thing. You take that too far, right? Um, the other one's a false zeal. And he says that that's more blameworthy still because it affects the sentiments which their conduct belies take upon themselves to act a part which does not belong to them they would fair see the church's mode of action influenced by their ideas and their judgment to such an extent that everything done otherwise they take ill or accept with repugnance some yet again expend their energies in fruitless contention being worthy of blame equally with the former to act in such a manner is is not to follow lawful authority but to forestall it and unauthorized assumes the duties of the spiritual rulers to the great detriment of the order which God established in his church to be observed forever and which he does not permit to be violated with impunity by anyone, whoever he may be. And he goes later, and I won't read the entire thing because this is a longer one, but he says, uh, among the prelates, indeed, one or other, there may be, um, that would be within this, this criticism saying that you may see somebody who holds to a belief that that is uh, heretical you may you may hold or be practicing something publicly that is worthy of censure okay and he says but even if even if that's the case he said subjects should be admonished not rashly to judge their prelates even if they chance to see them acting in a blameworthy manner lest justly reproving what is wrong so the reproof is is true it's just right so there, so even if you're even if they've done something bad even if they hold a belief that's, that's worthy of censure, you, you as a lay person are not permitted to do this because uh, it, reproving what is wrong, they be led by pride into greater wrong. They are to be warned against the danger of setting themselves up in audacious opposition to their superiors whose shortcomings they notice. Should therefore the superiors really have committed grievous sins, 
their inferiors penetrated by the fear of God ought not to refuse them respectful submission. The actions of superiors should not be smitten by the sword of the word, even when they are rightly judged to have deserved censure. Wow. So, so he's granting that, yes, they deserve censure. I mean, look, what are you talking about? Beliefs and behaviors that are so bad it would de deserve censure? Even if it's rightly judged, you aren't in a place to do it. But, that, yeah. but that's the core of their system. Yeah, absolutely. It's it a whole system. If you go to a state of contest website, it's all, this guy's bad, this guy's bad, this guy's bad. Times infinity, there's nothing good on their sites. There's nothing holy. There's nothing inspirational. There's nothing that calls you on to holiness. There's nothing that teaches you how to know Jesus more. It's just everyone else is wrong. And that should speak for itself. And I would just say, based off that quote, which is very powerful, you know, all the Catholics going around Bergoglio, Bergoglio, instead of Pope yeah. Francis, he right. is the Pope. And you are yes. withdrawing your submission and withdrawing your respect from the Supreme Pontiff, which is not a Catholic position. It's crypto set of a contism. I, I think I think that if we, you know, oh, I, this might get me in trouble. <laughs> this might get me in trouble. I'm going to say it though. So, so the church had a situation where people at, at a time started to believe that if they didn't take the wine and they only took the, the, the host, that they were only getting part, right? So I'm only getting the flesh. I'm not getting the blood. And the church is like, whoa, wait a second. <laughs> you, you're, you're not understanding how this works. And you know, you can't, you can't separate, you can't divide, you divide him in this way. If you take communion at all, you are taking the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord, right? So this is the way this is. So there was an underlying heresy at root. The church had a heavy hand in saying, remove the chalice, remove the chalice, because they, they attempted to deal with this. They attempted, they, they gave authoritative teaching on it. They tried catechizing people on it and still it persisted. So what did they end up doing? They removed the chalice and people scattered. People who were, and they, so underlying, they may have been in the midst, but they were crypto, they were crypto heretics on that score, right? They were, so they were, it was a secret thing. They could be in your midst, but they had certain assumptions about what they were doing that were at odds with what the church did. And when the church finally said, look, guys, here's the dividing line. This is going to do it because if you believe that and we take it, you're going to you're going to walk out because you're not going to think you're even taking communion anymore. And they did. And I said, I think that regardless of whether people agree and I have, I have certain things, you know, when, when Pope Francis wrote about uh, the Latin mass and traditional people, I defended that to the extent that I said, if anybody you know, even beyond the fact that he's the Pope, right? I said, you you put your head on a baseball bat, spin around 1,000 times, go online in your dizziness, tap away on a keyboard and push enter in Google and find the first traditionalist website, the first 100. And tell me if you see anything positive about uh, Pope Francis. <laughs> I said, because you're not. Already you're you, you, you're not. I said it's going to be negative, 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 bashing, bashing, bashing all the time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I said, so he know there's a legitimate problem. There's not even a question. I said, but the thing is, if, if you restrict it, I said, you are going to find that there are people inside that they may be floating around in a world where they say they're against the set of Acantas, but they're a kind of crypto settings. And, and secretly they have certain assumptions that they don't even maybe, they've kind of self-deceived, you know, they're, they're deceived themselves into believing, oh no, he's, he's Pope. I just don't have to listen to anything he ever says. And I don't right. even have to believe which is Catholic. literally the opposite of Catholic It's the yeah, opposite yeah, yeah, of Catholic yeah. teaching. Yeah. Yeah. And so <laughs> they, but they, they do that to justify. So they're kind of both side of the mouth in this thing. Right. And, and I think that there's a lot more of that than, and that's actually why I think set of a yeah. quantum is, is dangerous is because we actually are dealing like, if we just take the institutions. I mean, I'm not, there's not enough. They're not, there's no influence or anything like that, but there's enough crypto settings. There's enough people who don't even realize just how just how influenced they are by set of acantism that are prominent in traditional media, traditional Catholic media, that you say your assumptions are are so close to this that the only way that we can even trust that's not what you believe is that you tell us that's the case. But that's like somebody who has a really angry face all the time and people say, dude, you look really angry. And they're like, no, I'm happy. <laughs> And they and they and their faces like that, and you're like, I guess I gotta trust him. He says he's filled with the joy of the Lord. <laughs> he's constantly <laughs> angry all the time, but he tells me he's not. And that yeah. that's the same feel I get with so many people in traditional Catholic media is that they say, Oh no, we submit to the Pope, 
but every single day totally is just don't. bashing, bashing. Totally. And I, I think a lot of them want him to die. I don't think he was unreasonable to say. I think there's a lot of people out there who want me to die. That's the problem with SSPX yeah. is that they claim to submit to the Pope, but they totally don't submit to the Pope, which is a definition of schism is com continual withdrawal of your obedience and your submission to the Pope. And it's, it's just the problem. And my gosh, Jeremiah, we are just scratching the surface. There's so yeah. much yeah. to talk about. So maybe I can have you back on the show sometime. But, you know, to me, the end of it is just, uh, it's just so much to talk about. I'm just getting going. Um, I wish we had two hours. But for yeah. me, it's like I remember. You know, I know so known so many people where a girl dates a bad guy. Everyone knows the guy's bad for her, but the girl's like, no, he's the best guy in the whole yeah. world. He loves me and I love him. You just don't know him like I know him. You know, so they we have these people who, you know, I know what I know and everyone else is wrong. And I had that yeah. attitude as a kid as well. And I quickly learned after breaking up with that girl that when you are the only one who thinks you're right and all of your friends and family are wrong and can't see straight, it is a hundred percent certain that you are not the one who sees straight. <laughs> yeah, and when right. you think you're yeah. the only one in religion and you're a state of conscious and everyone else is wrong except you, and this is a problem in Protestantism too, you know, every other yeah. Protestant denomination is wrong. You can be a certain yeah. that the problem is with you and it's not with everybody else. And I think that's why, if I can say it again, get yellow pilled people if and if you don't want to buy the book right because it's it can be pricey it's a good book it's powerful beautifully written one of the greatest writers in the english language of modern times ronald knox um but he uh breaks down the history of schism he begins going to corinth then to the the donatist and the circumcellions goes on to montanism goes on to anabaptist the the medieval underbelly uh, the underworld of medieval heresy to talk about was was the Reformation as you know out of the blue as a lot of historians would like to to say or does it give as much credit to Luther or was, it, was there already a lot of this at play to where when he came in it was just ready to burn down the place um, and then he goes from there talks about the Jansenists uh, talks about the convulsion areas which that's a that's a wild ride you know swords to the chest and <laughs> kind of thing I mean real weird convulsions and stuff and then the quietus but each one of these so you have some that are more catholic than others like the jansenists i think the jansenists are the and if, if you if you want to follow this and say okay jeremiah you, you've listed all these groups you say jansenism and instead of accountism and sspx that they all kind of there's similarities in all of that and traditionalism in general that those similarities go back to jansenism we can see them on on the best display with them if you want to see that go to my go to my playlist over at, at Meaning of Catholics YouTube channel. And I have four, Set of Accountism and Jansenism, four part series. And it talks about it because I don't know how anyone can read it. Um, and I, that's what I do on my show is I actually have different pages and I read through parts and then we talk about it. And so you'll be able to see the book and the commentary from me. But the, I don't know how anyone can read that and not see within Set of Accountism the ghost of Jansenism. I don't know. You, you can't do it. The, the Augustinus, the ghost of the Augustinus, the ghost of Arnold, the ghost of Angelique, all of those temperaments and tendencies, the mm. Achilles heel, all of it is there. And it's just now it's it's hyper infused with electric speed with the Internet and, and mass media. That's all. It's what this is. And, and so, sadly, for most of them, you can't tell them that. Even if you're speaking clear as day, you can't tell them that because they already know it all. It's a huge problem of pride. And so, but if there are any state of contests out there, I mean, there are a lot of genuine people who just have got swept up in that movement, swept up in the emotional, you know, the church is wrong, the gates of hell prevailed and all of these other things. You know what? I just want to invite you to take a second look. I want to invite you to check out, at least be open and intellectually honest and take a look at Jeremiah's articles at meaningofcatholic.com and also his paleocrat diaries. Check out his stuff. I mean, he has Thank very you. deep in-depth mm -hmm. articles, videos, which will give you so much more than we've talked about here. We're just scratching the surface. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I appreciate it. I appreciate all that time. And I'm glad that you ended on the note talking about, you know, you might be somebody who swept up in it because it's easy in the conversation for people to interpret what we've said as, well, you know, are you just bashing the folks? Because you have to be able to make light, for example, of a pope in Kansas, you know, <laughs> made a pope by his parents in a hotel or something. Like you have to be able to giggle a little about this is that, how right? extreme it's got. But he yeah. thinks he's right, and nobody can tell him different. Yeah, you know, you have to be able to to crack jokes about 
people who believe that their index, you know, is authoritative and, you know, it's like trailer park monastery people. And you're like, okay, I, I hear you. <laughs> so you have to be able to have fun at the same time. That's why I started out by saying that, you know, my concerns were things that were pretty serious, you know, like it wasn't just the clown masses it, because I had never seen that. And, and to emphasize the point that Knox emphasizes in the book, and I, I've made it kind of a, a major part of my uh, new evangelization, the way I apply it in, in my work. And that is to recognize that otherwise good people often take otherwise good things too far. Mm -hmm. And that when they take it too far, it ends up dividing people. There's tension, wrongs are done on either side. And like Knox says, in the wink of an eye, before you even know it, there's been a schism. It doesn't matter if it was one side or the other, if it was being kicked out or if it was secession, it doesn't matter. The end result is the same. And that is we, that we, the world is left with one more Christianity, right? One more uh, of, yeah, that's, yeah, that's what he's, he's meaning that one more of the Christianities. He says it plural. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That you're left with one more now. So now you've got, you've got a, you know, a book with all the lists of them. And now it's another entry. Uh, in that list. And it's by the end of the day, there'll be more. <laughs> and there'll be more because it begets that. Because yep. this begets that, begets that. Because at the core of it all are anti Catholic presuppositions that are autonomous, that are that are eventually going to lead, whether through rigor or laxity, they're going to lead to the extremes where eventually even institutions will arise. And the ordering that I said earlier and how it plays itself out, this is repeated over and over again. And yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, all great points. Great points. Um, unfortunately, we have to end the show now. I'm super, super mm. thankful that, you know, you came on and I hope to have you back on again in the future to go in even mm. more depth, you know, really tackle this stuff deep, deeper. But uh, people check out uh, Jeremiah Bannister. We'll put his stuff in the show notes below. Also follow us on our new TikTok if you haven't already, Facebook, Instagram, and everything else down below. Check it out. If you need a Catholic speaker, Jeremiah is a speaker. He can speak on these topics very competently. Uh, you can check out his Paleocrat Diaries website, uh, or you can check out and or you can check out our website as well at thecatholictruth.org. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Please pray for us. Please pray. Seriously pray. This isn't just a, a, an empty request. Pray for all the people we're speaking about because it's only God who can bring people back home. It's only God who can do the heavy lifting. It's only Jesus. We, we are not Jesus. And sometimes we have a, a Jesus problem that we think we can convert the world when it's Jesus who actually has to do the heavy lifting. So please pray for these people and please pray for us so that we can always stay on the straight and narrow as we're always praying for you out there as well. Thank you all for joining us and God bless you.